Ephesians 4 and 30. I was listening to the ladies while they were playing the flutes a while ago, and I noticed that every time they hit a high note, you could call that high fluting. I'm just going to preach a little ladyfinger sermon tonight and hurry up and get out of the way and let Dr. Ruckman come. I know that you're anxious to hear him. And so I'll give you three points and leave off my poem and just get with it. I won't read you a letter tonight on somewhat of dedication and consecration in our kind of a day when Christianity is so anemic and feeble and weak in many sections and many lives. I want to read you something of what every child of God should be like and do when you've done the best that you could. It's an instant happened July the 21st, 1861. You call that the Battle of Bull's Run. We call it the Battle of Manasseh. And down in Lexington, Virginia, below that place, a couple of days later, they were trying to figure out, wondering how the battle went. They knew it was going to be one. They didn't know how it was going to turn out. And they were talking. Dr. White was there, pastor of the Presbyterian Church, and a man rode up on a horse. And he had a letter. And when he saw the letter, the handwriting, he knew right away who it was. And he said, we'll soon know how the battle turned out. And he began to read it, and this is what it said. My dear pastor, in my tent last night after a fatiguing day of service, I remembered that I had failed to send you my contribution to our colored Sunday school. In close, you will find my check for that object, which please acknowledge at your earliest convenience and oblige. Yours faithfully, T.J. Jackson. Here's a man after a battle. Their bodies to be buried, wounded to be attended to, rearrangements to be made, troops to be mustered, things to be straightened. And after such a day of that, of terror and heartache and death and dying, he saw something higher and more nobler. And that was the service of his God and his Lord and his pastor and back home and what the church was endeavoring to do. I would that we could have a revival that would do that and stir us up to that in our kind of a day. Our text says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit, whereby you're sealed until the day of redemption. O land of rest for thee I sigh, when shall the moment come when I shall lay my armor by and dwell in peace at home? Thank God I don't think it's going to be long until we'll stack arms and muster out. And I'm kind of looking forward to that. I've been loving someone I haven't seen for 44 years. And I'd like to see him. I often wondered what the Lord looked like when He walked the shores of Galilee. I don't know. I'd love to have been there when upon the mountain He broke the bread and blessed it and Fed 5,000, man, I'd love to see that. And little children he took up in his arms and blessed them. He said, such is the kingdom of God. I wonder what that was like. And when he walked up there to Golgotha's cross and bore my sins, all through the Word of God, I, I've got a glimpse of that. I've dwelt there often. 
But I don't know what he looked like, but thank God one day I'm going to be like old Job. I'm going to see him for myself and not another. And I long and look forward to that day for we're living in a time in, in which this old world is vermin infested and briar persist and spider hung and animal prowling and sin blighted and tear stained and grave covered and hell bent and judgment bound and anathema covered. But thank God, thank God it's not my home. And tonight I, I, I'm looking a little higher and I'm looking a little above. And, oh, I like to go out at night and look up and just kind of look to the north. I, I know it's there. I know it's there. I like in the springtime when I can go and see the Pleiades, those seven sisters that represents those seven churches we read of in Revelation 2 and 3 with their sweet influence. We don't have much influence anymore, but always after those seven sisters, the fool comes, arrives. I looked out tonight, the sky's gray, and it's cold, and the wind's beginning to blow, and everything is becoming barren and, and sterile and frigid, and, and there's no putting out of life. But thank God, when that comes spiritually, I'm going to be on the sunny banks of sweet deliverance. Amen. Oh, I've just got three things I want to say to you tonight in our text, and I'll be through. And grieve not the Holy Spirit, whereby you're sealed unto the day of addiction. Now, I'm not used to preaching to the side like this. This kind of, I told him I'd wind up being Episcopalian, sure as the word. <laughs> you know, one thing about the Baptists I admire, besides eternal security, and I, and I sure believe that. Someone said, oh, that's just that old Baptist line. Well, honey, you hang the line. I like it. But we've always had the pulpit right in the middle for preaching the Word, the Word. And boy, that's what we need tonight. Need tonight. But three things I want you to see. The first thing is the wonder of it. There is a day. Now, boy, this old world has its day. They have their holidays and their fun days and their sin days and... Every time you turn it around, man, they've got their music and got their band and got their march and they got their thrill and they got their crowd that's doing the shouting. And it seems like sometimes as children of God, we're somewhat passed by and, and in this world pushed over in the corner and to the side of the road. But one day, the wonder of it, there is a day. A wonderful day. I remember back when I was young and handsome and debonair and all of that. Young man, I got in the Army. And I never will forget after that first night out in the tent, that little colored cadre out there beating on the tent post with a stick. And I never heard such cuss words in all of my life. And... I knew right away I'd made a bad mistake. Very bad mistake. I remember overseas, two Easters, I was behind 50 caliber machine gun and snow was flying. Know what it was like, 48 below zero, and I knew where... Every can of pork and beans came from because every time I'd open one, pork and beans. Man, you'd eat those things, you couldn't digest them, and, and they just rattle around in your stomach all day and half of the night. And I counted the days and the hours and the minutes till I could get out of that man's army. And I remember coming back in New York City, and man, they wouldn't let us off and kept us all day and another night and half of another day. And you look over and there's cars. That's, that's United States. That's home. 
But I'd already told the Statue of Liberty, if you ever see me again, you're going to have to turn around. And boy, I had talking about dreaming about it and thinking about it. Man, I'd lay at night in my mind, I could go over the roads. And I could see the curves and the dips and the hills and the turn-offs until you turn off in that country road, boy, that led to the green, green grass of home. And I knew when I got in Carolina, you could always tell that old road go womp, 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 womp. And I said, thank God, thank God I'm getting close. And when I got down to where you turn off, I could look out over the hill and I could see the top of that country house. And I thought, thank God, man. Man, my heart palpitating. You talking about uh, buoyant and joyous and with expectation. And, and I thought, wonder if Dad's living. Wonder if Mama's there. Wonder if the children are there. Wonder who's going to be there. Wonder if they're all right. And boy, when I pulled in that driveway and I looked and saw that old white-headed mother come running down that walk, I said, Hallelujah, Hallelujah. Man, I'm home. I'm home. And the wonder of it, there is a day for the children of God. Don't you feel sorry for us. God bless you. We don't have to take our cap off and stand at the door stoop of this old world and beg for what I owe to. If you're saved, you're somebody. You're someone. I know that when he got me, he didn't get anything. But he took me from nowhere and put me to somewhere. He took me from a nothing and put me to someone. He took me out of the middle of nothing and set me right down in the middle of everything. And the wonder of it is, there is a day. There is a day. Oh, I'd like to see him. Tonight, some of you fellas, you ought to go home and take your wife, get real close, say, sweetheart, and just look in her eyes. And if you want to look in your darling's eyes and see something, just look real close. And if you look close enough, you'll see a man. And that man should be your reflection. Everyone that's saved, we got a hidden man in the heart. We've been born of his seed. And we're of his generation. And one day, thank God, he who's been standing behind our wall and looking forth at the window and showing himself through the lattice, thank God he's going to come when he sees himself in the eyes and in the life of his bride. Man, one thing about that eye there, that's the most unusual thing. You know, if you look close, you can see the little man in there. And right around it, you've got a whole lot of white there. And that white is kept white because there's a lot of blood flowing to that place that continually cleanses it. And tonight, I'm in a place, thank God, where the Son of God, His blood, is continually cleansing me and cleansing me and cleansing me. You look at those eyelashes. Oh, they put there, it's like no other hair on your body. And it has something about it that diffuses dust and particles and keeps your eyes clean. And I'm glad that God has put some bounds and habitation about the children of God that keeps us from the dirt and the filth and the carnality and the corruption of this dying old world. You've got a bone that's harder than any other bone in your body. And, and just like the mountains around Jerusalem, God's got it around your eyes. And we've got a little hole over there in the lower part of our eye where there's a well. 
And every day, thank God, we've got something that can wash us and, and wash us. And when we get tired and weary, boy, we can pull the shades on that thing and go to sleep. Yeah. I'm glad tonight that I've got his chromosome and I have his gene. And I have His image. And man, as I get more and more until that perfect day in which I too shall be perfect. And we're getting pretty close because we're down at the end of the church age. And soon the days of the Gentiles will be over and this old century will be over with. Oh, I know the ghost of Noah is walking again. And the darkness is getting more gross and thick till you can feel it. And that old woman, that old whore has, by her mixture, corrupted the bread that God's people eats on. Soon it's leaving time. I was out mowing this spring, and I passed the bush, and I looked down, and my whole hand just swathed in blood. And I said, well, you look at that. O.J. Simpson bush just stabbed me. Same day I went to the hospital to visit, and I hate to go down to the nursery because when a preacher comes in, whoever's there, husband or wife, first wants to get you and take you down and look at the babies. And each one's just dying inside for you to say it looks just like you. And you look at that little old bundle of wrinkles there, and sometimes you don't know which end to put the diaper on that thing, and, and everybody wants you to compliment them on the thing. But I notice that if it's a girl, there's a pink or red ribbon. And if it's a boy, it's a blue ribbon. The Scripture tells me that when a mother has a boy, she's unclean seven days, eight days to be circumcised. And then she has to go 33 more days for her purification. But when a girl is born... She goes two weeks and then counts 66 days for its purification. And so they put that red or pink flag there for a girl, blue for a boy. You know, you can cut your finger and you get infected, and that thing will turn red. Man, you got death, disease. But the Scripture says the blueness of a wound cleanses away the evil. And when the children of Israel removed and start to move the tabernacle of God and the vessels, they always covered the vessels with a blue covering. And what I'm trying to say is, if you're saved for the grace of God... We're fixing to go out through the blue. Hallelujah. Yeah. And the wonder of it is, there is a day. Not only that, there's a warranty that guarantees it. You're sealed under that day. The Scripture says, He that hath begun a good work in you will perform it until that day of Christ. And it's a good work. It's a good work. It's a good work. He never does any shoddy work. Got a lot of folks walking around, think they got old time Bible religion when all they got gold stones or kidney stones or something. 
You ask them, how are you doing? You would to God, you'd never ask it. God saves us. His burden's not heavy. His yoke's easy and His burden is light. I'd rather serve Him and fellowship with Him than anyone that I know of. I tell someone I'm just like an old circuit rider every night. I'm usually coming in out of the boondocks or out of the hills or the mountains or the sticks or the swamps or the sand hills or somewhere just like old John Wesley, just driving furiously. Folks think you're a little crazy. Well, boy, I, I like it, though. I like fellowship with him. Because I know when this old world let me down and friends forsaken me, man, I had someone that I could go to and I could make love with him and fellowship with him and, and thank God he, not one time has he ever failed me. Twenty years I've been living just for faith. I don't ask anyone for anything but him. A while back, got a little lean, didn't have but a couple of dollars, and I was praying, said, Now, Lord, you know what you promised, and I quoted a bunch of promises. Next day, that was Sunday, next day I went to the mailbox, and I just knew there'd be something in the mail. And I went, and there wasn't anything. My mailman runs about 1030. And so I came back about 12, nothing. And three o'clock in the afternoon, I'd been doing some more prayer, and I came back, nothing. Well, I prayed some more that night, in the morning, and about 10.30, the mailman came, and I went out there, and all I found was an advertisement. Someone want me to buy something. And I did some more prayer. And the next day, about 10.30, I thought, Lord, you... you you promised, and man, you could jingle what my riches. My life savings. About 10.30, the mailman went by, and I went out there, and there's two letters, and I opened them. And there was some money in each one, and I don't know about you, but you can take motion out of the ocean when you take emotion out of God's pure salvation religion. I don't know about you, but I, I got very emotional. And talking about the mule running away with a plow, I think it about ran away with a whole farm. And, and I got it, but I said, Lord, that's not enough. And you promised. About that time I saw the mailman go back again. And my mailman never comes twice on a day. And I went back and there's another letter, and I opened it, and, and man, that was enough. And, and I mean, I made two, three circles around the house before I could find the door. And a warranty that guarantees that we're sealed with the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. That little world woman trying to get to Jesus. Spent all she had on doctors. And the crowd's in the way. Crowd's always in the way. Trying to get crawling there like an animal. Saying, if I can just touch the hem of his garment. She finally just got where she could touch it. And then something happened. Virtue went out of him. And, and he knew it. And he turned around and said, who touched me? They looked at him, what are you talking about? I've seen folks get saved. God bless them. And everyone else sitting around so pious and nice. And they don't know what's going on. But I remember the day when I touched it in that garment. You know, the last thing you ever do when you finish a garment is you put a hem in it. Back on the farm, I remember the old days, you'd get flour and sacks and you know, everyone, they made bonnets, and they made counterpanes, and they made aprons, and made slips for the girls and everything, and Mother would make those slips, and, and she had all of us 12 kids. 
And I was the oldest one that didn't go to school, and I was the right size, and I hated it with a passion when my mother would come and want to hem that up, and she knew she could put it on me. She could measure a couple of girls above me or a couple below me. And I hated that thing. But I tell you, when you touch Jesus, you touch something that is finished, and the Spirit of God will seal it. And that thing, when you turn it up, Jesus said, if I be lifted up, if I be lifted up, I'll draw men unto me. And then it's sown, thank God. Needles, you know, they made holes in him, didn't they? But sealed unto the day of redemption. You know, when the Lord let the sun come up, he didn't have to go and put his signature on the sunrise to let people know that he did it. And when the Lord had that meadow, he didn't have to go put a laundry mark in the label of the meadow and say that belongs to God. He didn't have any angelic being to come down on the mountain and carve his initials or name there that says it belongs to God. And the cattle on the thousand hills, he never had to brand them, say they belong to God. And he never had to get a copyright on the songs that the birds sing when they sing their anthems and their doxologies and they extol him and chase those amens up and down the scale. Thank God he didn't have to take a copyright. And when he saved me, I didn't have to turn my collar around backwards and, and get a long look on my face and walk around all humped over like I was most miserable. He didn't give me an old cross to have to carry and a chain around my neck to dangle along. But I tell you what he did do. He put his spirit in my heart that cried, Abba, Father, my Father, my Father. I try my best not to get ulcers. I give them sometimes. Because when things don't go right and folks bother me, I have a solution. Like the prodigal son, I just rise and go to my father. And I tell my father on them. And the members of this church, you don't do like you ought to. It's a terrible thing when that man of God, that pastor, has to get on his name and call your name, and it's not pleasing, and he takes it before the throne. Amen. Folks may outfight me. They may outrun me. But I don't believe they could outpray me when I call upon him. I lost everything I had for this book. I lost my church. I had my family busted and lost my wife. And I lost my home, my house, and I lost my health. But don't you try to kid me about this because I know the author of this. And I know him that I can go to that gives songs in the night. And he promised to never leave me and never forsake me. And sometimes it's not, skies got dark and there wasn't any stars. But thank God there was always the comforter. The wonder of it, there is a day, the warranty that guarantees it. You can buy an old car, drive it around the block, and it's lost a couple thousand dollars. But this thing that God gives you called salvation, man, the longer you got it, the better it gets. It gets sweeter and it gets better. And then there's a warning. Don't grieve. The Holy Spirit has a lot of types. 
oil and dew and the wind and fire and rain and atmosphere. But the one that I like most is the dove. A dove, as long as its mate's alive and he's not grieved, he'll never land in an old dead tree, and he won't drink out of a muddy pool. And when you see a lot of Christians going back to the old dead trees and, and muddying up the water, you know that somehow they've grieved the Spirit of God. And when you lose the song in your heart and the joy and the thrill, don't blame it on the church. Don't blame it on the preacher. Just look in the mirror and say, that's the one. If I couldn't get more out of the church and God's Word than I could out of the world, I'd just do like Judas is carried, go hang around somewhere else. But a young fella, I remember, and I've got to hurry, someone killed a dove, its mate, and that old dove sat up there in a tree and just moan and tabor, sound like a drum roll. And I got in that army. Boy, I hated it in that morning when the bugler would come around. You can't get them up, you can't get them up, you can't get them up in the morning. You better get them up. First sergeant come around and said, Now, fella, I said, Look, cook's gone to a lot of trouble, got food ready, and your mother's aware if you don't eat, you ought to get up. No, he said, you bunch of buzzards, you got about three seconds to get out. If you don't get out, I'll kick you out. Yeah, amen. Boy, I never did like to hear that bugle. And at night, lowering of the flag, shadows lengthening, getting long, darkness coming on. Man, I thought that was a sad thing. But to have one of your buddies to get killed... And when they run that old flag down the half-mast and that bugle, man, them long, mournful sounds that reaches from here to the other end of eternity that drags his soul through such sadness and remorse. But there's one sound that was worse than that. And that's when someone... did that awful thing that disgraced their company or their outfit or their country. And they had to stand them up there before the troops and they get out with that little drum and play a role on that thing. Then boom, boom, boom. Oh, I'd heard that. I've been with them in the hospital when the doctor comes out and said, I'm sorry, their baby couldn't live. And, and I've seen them smite herself on their breast. Oh, no, no! I've seen that and I've had to go home. Letters edged in black, crate to be put on doors, sorrow to be hung on the heart. And I've seen them tabor on their breast. You read over in Nahum 2.7, or Huzab, that's that harlot, Roman Catholicism. She's defeated, and she's going up, and her maid's mourning and tabering on the breast like the morning of doves. And they play that roll call, and they come up and strip of everything, the rank. The insignia, the buttons. And they left standing there, 
Oh, they got a uniform on. But you can't tell what outfit they belong to. There's not a one that wants them. And there's a lot of Christians who get, get drummed out of service for God. Maybe you're here tonight and you're not saved. I'd hate to go to hell having been in this church and heard this music and heard the Word of God that's preached here. Man, I'd rather go to hell from any other place if I was going than this place. But you're here and God spoke to you. And you know He spoke to you. And just listen to your heart. It's that old drum playing a funeral march to the grave. Yeah. May tonight be the night that you'd come. Say, Dr. Noy, I'd like to know him. I'm tired of being a nobody. I'm tired of walking through this mess by myself. My burden's my own. My trouble's my own. And all I just do is hope that somehow, way I'll get out of it. But tonight you ought to come and get something that you can know about. And if you're a Christian here and you've been disgracing the Lord, don't get drummed out of service. Dr. Noah, thank you, sir.